Hi, and welcome to the 4th U Dimension podcast. My name is Ember Kelly, and I'm the Director of Religious Education at the 4th Universalist Society in the City of New York. I am joined today by Reverend Skylar Vogel for our Getting the Message series. This is a uh, podcast slash video that looks at the deeper thoughts of the service, kind of the thoughts that went into the writing of the reflection, a reflection on the reflection, if you will. Uh, and so uh, as a special attempt for both the video and podcast form, we are going to include the uh, playback of the sermons. You'll be able to watch the sermon uh, and then hear our reflections after it. So let us transfer into uh, watching both the reading and the sermon. By Stephen Dunn, an American poet and recipient of the 2001 Pulitzer Prize. It is entitled, The Revolt of the Turtles. On gray, forgetful mornings like this, sea turtles would gather in the shallow waters of the Gulf to discuss issues of self-presentation and related concerns like if there were a God, would he have a hard shell and a retractable head? And whether speed on land was of any importance to a good swimmer. They knew that tourists needed to placate their children with catchy stories and amuse themselves with various cruelties such as turning turtles over on their backs and watching their legs wriggle. So the turtles formed a committee to address how to live among people who, among other atrocities, want to turn you into soup. The committee was also charged with wondering if God would mind a retelling of their lives, one in which sea turtles were responsible for all things, right-minded and progressive, and men and women for poisoning the water. The oldest sea turtle among them knew that whoever was in control of the stories controlled all the shoulds and the should nots. But he wasn't interested in punishment, only ways in which power could bring about fairness and decency. And when he finished speaking, in the now memorable and ever deepening waters of the Gulf, all the sea turtles began to chant, only fairness, only decency. Over the past few months, I have gotten asked one question far more than others at Fourth Universalist. It's a question that gets to the heart of who we are as a community and what we believe. It is this. Is our congregation welcoming to Republicans? Now, for those of you new to our congregation, the question emerges from the interplay between our unapologetic commitment to social justice and our welcoming non quill come as you are theology. The question about welcoming Republicans seems to understand this tension, seeks to understand this tension and gain clarity on what we actually believe. It worries that perhaps we are hypocrites or are disingenuous. We're not as welcoming as we pretend to be or are only welcoming to those who agree with us. It questions a core Unitarian Universalist principle that we have no creeds or doctrines, suggesting that perhaps we do. It is just a political one. When I think about this question, it is not an intellectual exercise to me. Many of my relatives are conservative Republicans and not the Mitt Romney, John McCain, Lisa Murkowski kind. Instead, they are the folks who will agree with you when you say that Fox News is fake news. But then upon further investigation, you'll discover it's because they believe that only the One America News and Newsmax tell the real truth. Some of these family members have walked among us at Fourth Universalist and will no doubt walk among us again. So when I think of them milling around coffee hour, meeting you all, 
I think it's crucial to be clear what kind of welcome we are talking about. It's first and foremost important to realize it's not about social etiquette. I would expect Unitarian Universalists to engage with respect and civility to anyone who enters our religious home, presuming that they are respectful and civil and non-threatening in return. If someone is kind and not making people feel unsafe and not displaying toxic beliefs, they should be treated well. It's hard to know, of course, what people actually believe and we can't police what is on people's heart. We can only put expectations on actions and behaviors. But we do know that welcoming people is not about social niceties. The true meaning of welcome goes much deeper than that. It means not just to treat someone with friendship, but I think to offer the change for them. When we talk about this in terms of our anti-racism work. Welcome doesn't mean just being nice to people of color who come to Fourth Universalist. It means white people giving up meaningful power and the congregation being willing to actually change to be less embedded in whiteness. It's about recognizing that when many in the congregation say us or we, they really mean those of us who are white or those with certain privilege. And then being willing to redefine us and we and what those words mean in order to de-center whiteness and privilege. Real welcome means being willing to be changed by those you welcome. So I've struggled with that kind of welcome, with conservatives, with my family, and in my role here at Fourth Universalist. On my very first Sunday with you at Fourth Universalist five years ago, my eventual conservative in-laws were visiting New York and were planning to come to that service. I was nervous already. It was my big debut. It was homecoming Sunday, the first time that many people would see me and hear me. But I also had planned to offer an anecdote about the congregation's history of being queer friendly. My eventual in-laws were evangelical Christians from a small town who are not supportive of marriage equality and generally uncomfortable with the concept of gay rights. And certainly they were not used to hearing such things in church. So I was faced with an uncomfortable choice. Did I avoid the subject of our congregation's queerness so they would feel comfortable? The way, that way I could avoid tension and conflict or should I go ahead and preach my convictions but make them uncomfortable, risk alienating them or even have them judge me? If it seems like there is an obvious and morally correct choice, that of course I would preach what I believed in, let me suggest this is exactly the tension that we wrestle with as a congregation when it comes to welcoming conservatives and Republicans. We should be polite and friendly to those people who are friendly and kind to us, as my family certainly would never be rude or disrespectful to anyone they met at church. But if real welcome means being willing to be changed, to alter ourselves and our vision for our community to accommodate others, I can't see how we can do that when it comes to certain values held by conservatives, especially when so often when they are predicated on the rejection of other people's experiences and very humanity. Here is the truth of the matter. If we bend over backwards to ensure that Republicans, conservatives, or mega people feel welcome here, we are telling many others that they are not. If, for example, we curb our language about white supremacy because we are told it is too divisive, we are no longer welcoming of those who experience white supremacy every day. If we muzzle ourselves from calling out microaggressions because we don't want someone to feel uncomfortable about being called out, we fail that person who has been aggressed. If we resist about talking about pronouns or degendering bathrooms, we are choosing to care more about the discomfort of those holding hurtful beliefs than the safety and comfort of trans and non-binary people. The unfortunate truth is that we cannot have it both ways. And cynically, it might appear to be picking some people over others. 
but it actually means that we are serving something higher, higher than any one person, higher than anyone's comfort level. We serve human beings first and their right to freedom and safety and dignity. I do not believe that Republicans or conservatives or mega people are in danger of having their rights denied or their humanity denied at Fourth Universalist. They may feel uncomfortable, but they do not feel unsafe. Their discomfort is really about losing control, not no longer having their feelings automatically privileged or centered above the needs of others. Religious liberalism at its very core is about something greater than the mere collection of different values and beliefs. It's more than making people just feel comfortable and cozy on Sunday morning. I said before, and I said it earlier in this service, that UUs can often believe anything that they want, so long as their beliefs are bound by love and justice. It's very easy, I think, to focus on the first part of that, the we have the freedom part. But the love and the justice part is not a throwaway line. It's the key to the boundaries of our faith. If you aren't for love and justice, collective liberation for all, then you will have a hard time feeling welcome in a true way with us. We should not feel bad about this. Unitarian Universalists should not feel bad about this. These are the guiding principles and virtues of our faith tradition. These are principles that can and have changed the world. They are more important than political diversity, than just collecting a variety of beliefs all under the same roof. It's not about politics or parties, but about religious values. Values that call us to kindness and understanding of difference, of course, but also the boldness, systemic change, and the subversion of privilege and power. If you believe in those values, then this is the place for you. If this feels uncomfortable, we hope you'll consider sticking around to learn and grow with us because we all feel, no matter where we are on the political spectrum, uncomfortable and challenged by the evolving wisdom around love and justice. This is a place for those things, but it is also a place of grace and transformation and learning. And if this feels irreconcilable, we accept that but it is not fair to expect our community to change the heart of who we are. Whether you are a liberal or conservative, Democrat, Republican, or independent, just know this, the work of justice cannot be sacrificed for the comfort of the privileged because then it is no longer just. The safety of those on the margins will be prioritized because if they are not, then they are not safe and they are not welcome. The mission of this congregation, if we are true to ourselves, will always be about liberation. Liberation for each of us and each other and the world. Not guided by politics, but principles, love and justice for all. This is what we do. It is beautiful. It is life-giving and transforming. Let us always be bold in living it today and always. Amen. So, uh, Reverend Schuyler, this this was perhaps a little bit of a a, a contentious sounding topic. You know, it, it uh, it's not quite the the easy one. What was what was the, what led you to want to talk about this today? Well, I've been being asked this question a lot, really since the election in November, but before that too. This question about do we welcome everyone? Uh, and what are the boundaries of, of our welcome? And I think the most clear division in our country right now that, that a lot of people are struggling with is is the, the liberal conservative uh, Democratic Republican divide um, and the anxiety around that. Um, and, and fourth use, the tension between fourth use two values, one of being a sort of unabashedly progressive space while also being a, a place that really values this welcome of all, uh, you know, come as you are, we don't have a creed kind of mentality. And there's clearly a conflict there. And it's a conflict that exists within Unitarian Universalism and has for a very long time. But has, as we've gotten more polarized as a society, that question becomes more and more real 
Um, I think we assume that religious liberalism and political liberalism has always been aligned, and that is not true historically. It just happens to be right now. And so I think that contrast is even more uh, obvious to our members these days. Definitely. It definitely seemed to uh, it both resonated with me as I, as I read it in preparation and as I listened to it today, and it seemed to really uh, resonate with folks uh, as well from what I uh, noticed. So I, I worked up some questions. I jotted down some notes as I was listening, trying to think of some good uh, questions. So I want to start with, uh, and it's something I think we've both discussed maybe in the past on the podcast, as well as in some of our personal conversations. Uh, but a lot of people, and you mentioned it in the reflection, a lot of people think of uh, welcome as being like this, okay, we're really nice to everybody that comes in. And I feel like this is a very uh, American thing, that it's maybe less so about the content of things being done or things being said, as long as it's done in like a very nice and respectful way. Um, so why do you think that, to me, uh, and it seems like from the message, that welcome is so much more than that? Um, you know, what, what, why do you think people assume that being welcome just means, means being nice? And what, what could it be instead? Well, I think I think we all like to think of niceness as being welcoming because it's simple. You know, we all are able to, most of us at least, be uh, friendly to a stranger because it doesn't ask very much of us, right? To see someone coming in and smile at them, to shake their hand, to you know, offer them a mug of coffee, those are pretty easy to do, right? It doesn't require any culture change. It doesn't require any any giving up of our own values our own priorities as a community or as an individual. And so I think we value niceties and friendliness because it's it's those of us who have any degree of social skill kind of can, can do that. Um, but I think the deeper form of welcoming as we talked about in the service is, is this form that requires something of us, which is that when we are truly open to another human being and who they are and what they bring and, and their, their wisdom and their gifts and their perspective, we have to if we are truly welcoming welcoming them into our life, we invite ourselves, invite them to to really engage with the difference and and offer ourselves to learn from them. And that is both a very beautiful thing, but can also be very risky depending on who you're trusting for that. So so welcome is a degree of trust and is a degree of risk that, that are part of that. And uh, in some cases, it's I think a very uh, wonderful thing to welcome. And I think other cases it can be. Um, destructive because if the person who you are welcoming and, and risking change with is not someone who has your best interest at heart or who um, who maybe denies someone's humanity or um, is toxic in some way, then that runs a real risk. I think that makes sense, and uh, I couldn't help but think about uh, both during during the reflection and during uh, what you were saying right there. I couldn't help but think about. Uh, the tension that comes from trying to both be welcome and hold on to your principles when you have family uh, that, that is a bit uh, more on the conservative side. As somebody who was raised evangelical and uh, most of my family is still in that kind of world and I've, I've watched them kind of go from, you know, the very nice, uh, you know, like we just want the Republican vision uh, to, to much more like there's, you know, an evil agenda out to get us. It's been really hard to both try and welcome them as family and to to hold on to those relationships while still uh, valuing the principles that I stand for in my life. So it sounds like you've uh, struggled with similar. How does that tension uh, really feel for you? It's difficult because, you know, as, as with your role uh, in any public role, you have to balance the responsibilities and, um, you know, and I think you are calling to do the role in an authentic, sincere way with their other relationships that are not professional, right? So when in the sermon, when I talked about whether or not I wanted to share about the congregation's history of, of being, uh, you know, queer welcoming, queer friendly, I knew that would potentially disrupt my family who was there and, and concern them. Um, and and that's a tension that I think we all we all walk. I certainly walk with it with when it comes to like sermon anecdotes, even about my family, right? Like 
there are things that I cannot share about my family from the pulpit, even though it might make a great sermon, even though people might really resonate with it. I can't do it because they're alive and they're listening, um, or they may just may not may, may not listen, but it'd still be inappropriate for me to share. So I think it's really it's a it's a hard hard line to to tread. Um, and I know a lot of our, our members and a lot of our listeners struggle with this too, of, of how to be authentically yourself while also maintaining a, maintaining a relationship with someone that you love. Um, and also having some grief that your relationship with them will, may not ever be able to be what you want it to be because you're not able to be fully honest or fully open with them because of, of the beliefs that they hold. So there's lots of ways that that manifests uh, in in our lives and it's and there's a grief there that should be acknowledged a sadness that that prevents a deeper relationship maybe with our parents with siblings maybe with our children um because of politics and and in some ways that's just how the world is but i also think that it bears acknowledging that um, there are things we can't do to overcome that um, in part because where we are right now definitely it seems sometimes you just have to have to live in that and that tension. And obviously, in, you talked about it a little bit uh, in the reflection about welcome as being, un, you know, the welcome causing somebody to be uncomfortable versus the type of welcome that we're giving as a community, uh, causing people to feel unsafe. And I mean, the same applies to, to families as well. That, you know, obviously, if you're feeling unsafe, it's always appropriate to set up boundaries. Uh, and uh, that, that really resonated with me because welcome is about, is it, should cause us to think about power and to think about uh, what our actions are saying about who we prioritize. And you know, I, I'm curious uh, if you if you got a little bit more that you'd like to dive to dive deeper into thinking about uh, how welcome is kind of sometimes a display of of power and of priorities. Absolutely. Well, you're you're totally right. I mean, welcome in its very nature implies a power dynamic, right? If I am welcoming you to a place or a, a community or anywhere, the implication is that I am in control, right? Like I get to decide how you are treated when you come in, in and out, right? This is my place somehow that I have priority, I have privilege, I have power to be able to either choose to welcome you or not. And, uh, and that puts the person who is being welcomed in a position of of, of lesser power, uh, of being somewhat dependent upon the welcomer's discretion, right? So, you know, what does it take to wear out your welcome? You know, when is someone no longer welcome at Fourth U? Um, you know, when do you be when is when does it become clear that you are in someone else's space and they don't want you anymore? I mean, I think you talk to people in your youth spaces who who were warmly embraced. Maybe they were a person of color. Maybe they were trans or non-binary, and and they were welcomed with open arms until they started asking harder questions or or making people feel a little bit uncomfortable about maybe the congregation not being as anti-racist or, or or queer friendly as they thought they were. And all of a sudden, the doors of welcome slammed shut because the welcome was conditional upon upon them being a certain thing. Um, and once that they weren't that thing anymore, then the power dynamic showed up where it said, you know, this is not what we are here anymore. You don't get to define this community. And so I think part of what welcoming means is being able to, if you are in that position of power, basically to say like, look, you know, I have power institutionally here at Fourth U, at some other place that I am at, maybe at work, right? Bosses certainly welcome new people. They, there's businesses welcome customers. There's an awareness of, look, this is the power that I hold. And yet I'm a, I'm, I know that that power is based upon often historical privileges. Uh, it's built upon the back of oppressed and marginalized people historically. And that part of our work is to subvert and challenge those historic inequalities and to offer an opportunity to have the institution really understand that the people who are not maybe in power there have have every right to have ownership over it as much as anyone who's already there. And so even on a simple level of talking about like fourth universalist and growth, right? Do we want to grow as a congregation? It's really important that we see that as as not just a question, do we want to gain more people so people can play pet pledges in the most cynical way, which in some congregations I've served, there really has been. We need more money, so we need to get more people, so we need to grow. 
But in, and when we talk about oppression and power, we talk, we should talk about growth in the perspective of we are growing. We work for growth. We work to be welcoming, not for any of that stuff, not even just to make ourselves feel good, but we do it because we recognize that historically our congregations have been places that have been exclusive for all kinds of reasons. And so if you're not inter interested in growth, what you're really saying is that you're not interested in subverting that historic power and privilege to ensure that other people who have not always felt that these spaces are their home can feel like they're their home. So, so being interested in growth and being interested in welcome is really an anti-racist um, theological position, I believe. Well, and I couldn't help but think as you were talking about uh, congregations that seem welcoming at first, I couldn't think, help but think about both the stories I've experienced as well as so many others that I've heard of people who you know, came in as a marginalized person to a new community and they were welcomed. They thought this was a really great community, but as they step towards any sort of leadership, any sort of power in a sense, then suddenly they find themselves on the outs. Suddenly, oh, hey, you know, we're, we're okay with, with, with your type of people here, but that doesn't mean we really want you as, as spiritual leaders. Um, and I mean, I think that's definitely a, a display of how uh, sometimes that welcome can very much be about holding on to power. They, they're welcomed as long as they don't threaten the way that things have always been done. Right, right, exactly. And and there's a recognition also that that faux welcome is actually a tool for the powerful to maintain their power, right? So if you are a white male cis minister and you can point to your congregation and say, I've got a lot of diversity here, look at me, right? Your power increases by having those people there and so that looks good for you, right? Uh, you look like you're super woke and put together. Um, and so you're benefiting that from that, from getting more power, from getting those people there. But you're not going to be benefiting necessarily once people start to sort of challenge the, maybe the paradigm of what that leadership looks like. And so it's important for us to recognize that, that power and privilege works in, in many sort of intersectional negative ways, right? So that like... It, it reinforces potential white supremacist power sometimes to have a very diverse group of people because they're essentially being used as props um, for the powerful. I and mean, we see this in commercials, right, in like in capitalist efforts, right, to promote diversity when there's not a real desire for real systematic change, but there is a, a tokenism of, of people. And so being conscious of when that is happening and that's where that power and privilege comes up. Is there a sincere effort to share power, to change the system, to make it freer for everyone? Or is it simply a way to protect the people in power with a veneer of respectability? Shifting gears and thinking about welcome, though, as we've had this conversation, one of the things that I've been thinking about is welcome during COVID. Um, I mean, as we've moved to an all online space, a lot of congregations, a lot of faith communities have adapted that in completely different ways, you know, some in person, some online. Uh, but with online, uh, people have taken so many different approaches. And I think one of the things um, that that has said a lot to me about Forth um, has been the fact that we do post our, our links publicly, that we are saying, look, we may be online, but our doors are still open for you to, to come in. Like a, a lot of, there's a lot of congregations that, you know, they have their mailing list and that's who gets the links and it goes out by a newsletter on like Saturday nights. And um I, so I think that I wonder if you have any that that's been something that's been on my mind in terms of thinking about welcome uh, since I've since I've started here. Uh, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how we do welcoming well during COVID. Uh, yeah, or could do it better. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, it's not one that I uh, it's been a seat of the pants kind of adventure these last, you know, it's almost last year. Uh, because it's really tough when you can't see someone in person and say, hello, you're new. I don't know you, but I want to. Right. That's that's what you want to do. And that's what that's what welcoming feels like in the spirit of, of community. And it's very hard to do that on Zoom. I don't know probably half the people who show up on Sundays on Zoom. Uh, I recognize their names now because I see them uh, coming. But but if I haven't met them in person, it's a it's an incredible experience to to feel like our community has grown and expanded in ways that I do not understand and, uh, and don't really have my head around. So I think it's been important, right, that we 
we are very clear that we want people to come that we don't have we don't have some high wall you have to jump over to join us and, and feel happy that um that you can join us in any way whether it's like in your bed in your pajamas and with your screen off or whether it's you know dressing up for your sunday best and being on camera like whatever you want to do we're just happy that you've decided to be with us so i think it comes down to a lot of that making sort of hitting it again and again letting us let people know that we're accessible that we're here that the pandemic may be happening but we're not we're not you know stopping doing this work and also that um you know small things like the closed captioning right um the way that we try to put our pronouns in our in our um little name ids the fact that we talk about being anti-racist in the beginning of the services these are ways that you know maybe if we were in person it would be more obvious from the very start that you would know that fourth you were was all those things but because we're online we have to be really intentional about saying those things because we have so many new people who are joining and because because we're not in person you don't have those casual conversations that sometimes create the community so we have to we have to be really explicit about doing that yeah, and intentional seems like a good word because I mean it's a real welcome in the sense of what you were talking about in the message is that you have to to do this intentionally. And I mean, uh, we uh, there was rumors and conversation going around in progressive faith circles about uh, the need to be uh, on guard against maybe Zoom bombings and things this weekend. And to still keep that openness, it requires extra work. It requires being intentional, like. You know, if it means that we have to scroll through and make sure that nothing inappropriate is like uh, being flashed on somebody's screen, then, you know, the, it takes work. But that intentional welcome takes work. It does. It does. Because there's always a risk, right? And this is, goes back to this question of like, who do you, you know, how do you, how do you actually embody this in a real way? You know, we, ha we risk every time we have an online service, we risk the chance of getting Zoom bombed, having people come and do really inappropriate and offensive things to us. I mean, it's super sad and scary that, you know, you and me and our board president got an email from the, the UUA, our denomination, being like, be careful this week. You know, if you're there on Sundays, and we don't broadcast from the church itself, but if you're there on Sundays, like, maybe don't go in because our buildings have, you know, there's been a credible, credible threat to liberal religious communities. Maybe don't be in the building on Inauguration Day because there's some fears from the federal government about that. That's a scary place and it drives me nuts because we've been we've been the victims of vandalism multiple times already and uh you know it doesn't surprise me that it, it is in this world view of, sort of post 2016 um but to not compromise our welcoming spirit i think is a real testament to the congregation's resiliency because even though we've been hit by those things right we hit because we became a sanctuary church we got hit because we have a black lives matter banner um it has not diminished our desire to be welcoming in those areas that really count. Wow, this is some some deep stuff. Uh, so speaking of deep stuff, uh, I'd like to maybe kind of, as our as our final piece here, loop this back into talking about like the UU principles and like what you, you talked about uh, love and justice being the the guiding way of how we apply these principles. So. Maybe for those unfamiliar, could you tell us a little bit about what exactly the UU principles are? Uh, but how does that relate to being welcome? Right. Well, so we have, we like to say we have no creed, um, which is true. And I think the creed really is about theological beliefs. Um, we do have, we do have things we believe. And uh, some of those are, are articulated in what are called the seven principles, maybe soon to be eight. We will see. Uh, our faith is constantly evolving and changing and, and trying to learn as the world world learns. But the, the number of these principles talk about, about things that uh, relate to love and justice. The very first one is the inherent worth and dignity of all people. The second one is justice, equity, and compassion for all. Now, these may sound pretty obvious, right? Like, uh, you know, of course, of course, justice and love is compassion are good. But, but obviously, this is a world that, as we saw last, you know, in the last few weeks, white supremacists invading the Capitol building like it's it's not a message that is inherently obvious to a lot of people in this world so we are very clear um that this is where we come from um and and our our faith has been working to push the boundaries of who matters uh who deserves love who deserves justice 
for, for many, many years. The origins of our faith tradition here at Fourth Universalist, the Universalist faith, was founded on this idea that God was too good and loving to want anyone on this planet to go to hell, that everyone would be fine universal salvation, that everyone would find heaven eventually. Um, that was a radical idea at a time when, when a lot of people were worrying about going to hell and burning and having tremendous suffering for eternity. I mean, it sounds laughable and insane now, but people took that really seriously and were tormented by the idea of it. And so universalism come along and say, it's fine. Everyone matters. God loves everyone and wants everyone to be reconciled with them. That is pretty beautiful and pretty powerful. And so once you start, once you start believing that God loves everyone, it's not that far a leap to realize that God wants us to love everyone and care about everybody and continue to expand that. So, you know, universalists and Unitarians were at the forefront of looking at criminal justice reform and recognizing that, you know, if God is able to save the the criminal, maybe we should treat them with respect as well and look for rehabilitation and learning in the same way that God would eventually re rehabilitate all souls. Um, and so you see Unitarian Universalists being at the very forefront of that movement in the 1800s, being some of the anti-abolitionist types or, uh, you know, abolitionist types who opposed slavery when it was not in any way popular. I think we, we tend to assume that that was a fairly common perspective in the North and, and abolitionists before the Civil War were considered pretty, pretty ragged. Uh, there were not people you'd invite to tend to be, you know, high society. They were, they were pretty radical in a way that maybe like BL, BLM protesters would be today, um, or, you know, democratic socialists, or maybe even Antifa. I mean, if that was a real organization, which it's not, um, they, uh, they were not polite society people. And so to be able to look back and see our, our, our spiritual forebears who, who cared about these causes, expanding liberty, expanding justice, uh, you know, we can look back at them and say, this isn't just a modern phenomenon. We're talking about love, justice and love, not because I say so from the pulpit of Fourth Universalist, not because a lot of people at Fourth U are Democrats, uh, we do it because we come from a long line of spiritual ancestors who have fought and some of them have died for these causes of expanding liberty and, and justice. And that we really need to take that seriously um, as not a partisan or political stance, but as a religious moral one. And, and so for me, that cuts through a lot of these questions of like, you know, are you excluding Republicans? Are you being mean to Republicans? Are you, are you being overly partisan? We're not being any of those things. We come from a tradition that believes in the human potential, that believes in human dignity, and has been believing in that and evolving and changing and learning about what that means for over 200 years. And we are the spiritual uh, you know, inheritors of this tradition. And in this moment in time, it's unfortunate that there is a major political party in this country that seeks to undermine uh, and abolish so many of the, the things that we believe in. Uh, and and that's a shame and it's tragic and it's very disturbing, but that's the world we live in. And our spiritual ancestors, we would hope would expect that we in our day would have the courage to stand up for what we believe in, in the same way that they did uh, to fight the injustices of theirs. Well, that seems like a heck of a place for us to end it right there. That is, uh, that is some powerful stuff to, to chew to chew on mentally for a little bit. So hopefully our, our listeners uh, enjoy getting to sit and think with that one for this week. So Reverend Schuyler, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ember, for, for having me. Thank you to everyone who's listening. Yep. Thank you to our listeners. We uh, appreciate you stopping by and listening. We always appreciate any likes or subscriptions. It helps make sure the podcast gets more visibility. So thank you all for